Do you ever worry that there might not be clean water when you open your faucet? But what if there was no faucet? While working in Kenya last year, I learned that nearly two billion people must walk two-thirds of a mile each day to access water, and half of those people need to treat the water that they carry home before they can drink it. Ironically, the materials that we need to treat and distribute clean water must be mined, but the mining process itself can degrade water quality. As a geochemist who specializes in the environmental chemistry of mined materials, I can tell you that a big part of the job of producing the metal that goes into pipes and faucets is protecting water quality. In fact, a senior manager with a major international mining company recently told me that his job is about water, 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 and water. We Montanans love clean water. And we're blessed with abundant supplies of clean water high in Rocky Mountain watersheds, which paradoxically are underlain by some of the world's largest and best mineral deposits. As a result, we have a rich history of mining and some legacy-affected water. Nowhere is this paradox better illustrated than in Butte, Montana. We're at the richest hill on Earth. Some 21 billion pounds of copper were produced in the late 19th and 20th century. Well, this copper electrified our nation. It, it, it brought water into millions of homes. Fortunes were made and technology was advanced and the public health was protected, but it came at a cost. And today, the Berkeley Pit is a Superfund site filled with acidic and metal-rich water that is toxic. Understandable concern about not repeating the mistakes of the past led us to the philosophy that we could either have mining or we could have clean water but we couldn't have both. And that philosophy has kept us from advancing the development of new mineral deposits. In fact, the last mineral deposit to be developed on undisturbed ground in Montana began work 22 years ago. Worse yet, this has held us back from learning more about research and development to develop new tools of doing this in better ways. As much as we love our water, we love our metals too. Montanans enjoy metals in recreation, in agriculture, in telecommunications, and in energy. Heck, look at this beautiful room we are enjoying today. It's just that we would prefer that these materials be produced somewhere else and brought here so we can use them at an incremental energy and environmental cost. How is that sustainable? We need to move beyond this last century either or thinking to end strategies, superior technologies, which rely on synergistic process that enable us to accomplish the material production we need while protecting water quality. Biotechnology is that type of and solution. You see, it turns out that the oldest organisms on the planet, the microbes, have this figured out. They have the ability to transform nitrogen and sulfur and metals to insoluble and non-toxic forms. We are wise when we align our actions with their capabilities. As a geochemist, I branched out in this direction of biotechnology in doing this study, looking at selenium release from mined material. And when I realized that when I inoculated with bacteria from the mine seep, that I saw 10 times less selenium shown in the red bars than when I didn't, shown in the blue. In fact, in subsequent studies, I was able to confirm that this process did not happen when the microbes were absent. And I also learned that the process was temperature dependent 
and oxygen sensitive. We use genomic methods to identify the organisms like Dechloromonas that are responsible for the process. These are the types of information that we can use to develop biotechnological solutions to the management of mined materials. Mining operations have a life cycle, beginning with exploration and moving into design, and then through the uh, extraction process and into closure, the remediation phase. Beginning with that end in mind, I'm privileged to work in places from Chile to British Columbia, developing biotechnological solutions to the management of mined materials, together with scientists and engineers from industry and academia, including those from the Center for Biofilm Engineering here at Montana State University, we are developing micro-scale solutions to watershed scale problems. The time we have for this research and development is critically limited by the availability of clean water. This figure from Science Magazine at the end of last year summarizes the United Nations projections for our population growth. By the time your child retires in the year 2050, it's likely that our population will grow by 50%. And very possibly, we will have 13 billion people on this planet by the year 2100. A lot of that growth will happen in Asia and Africa, where infrastructure is, is limited and water is already critically affected. We're told that a child dies every eight seconds from waterborne illness. That means that while I've been speaking with you here, 58, no, 60 children will have died. Recognizing the hopes and expectations of those who lack access to clean water, but who join us today by, by webcast, I hope, the need for and solutions is compelling. If we all want the metal chairs we are sitting on and the clean water we are drinking, we can no longer indulge in last century either or thinking. We need to work together to develop and solutions to the sustainable production of materials and clean water. Thank you.